sometimes that word is tossed around too casually. And for me, she is the embodiment of that. And I just am so appreciative. And that's one of my favorite songs from her immense catalog of songs. So again, give it up for Jennifer Farron. And the good just keeps on coming because today uh, one of my dearest colleagues in this profession is with us. A little bit about Dr. Edward. Um, if you notice a lilt in his voice, it's not a southern accent. It's a South African accent. And, uh, huh? Way South Africa. Yeah, not this South, but another South. And... Um, when you think of Centers for Spiritual Living globally, uh, there is one preeminent award that they give for excellence, and it's called the Ernest Holmes Award, and he is the recipient of that. He is an award-winning author. Um, if you ever took Essential Ernest Holmes, which is a seminal class in our certificated program, he is one of the responsibilities for co collaborating and bringing that book together. Uh, he is the person that led us on our Bali adventure, for those of you who went with us. And um, it's amazing that he's here today because just last week he stood in front of his congregation where in Santa Rosa proper more than 3,000 homes were destroyed from that fire affecting many within his community. And uh, in his own brilliant and eminent way, he found ways to give comfort. And they are very much affected by that. And I said, please, if you need to stay, and he goes, no, I want to be with you guys. So we get an opportunity to love on him, and I will tell you he would welcome that. And would you give him a great SLCA welcome for Dr. Edward Wood. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. David. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else today because the award, the doctoral recognition going to Dr. David is very, very important. It, and I, I've got so many notes to share with you about it. So afterwards, when we close the service, please stay behind so I can tell you why it is so important, the award that he is receiving and what it means. So greetings from Santa Rosa. We think we're a sister community. Uh, and as you heard, we're going through a lot of trouble right now. Um, on Monday, two weeks ago, a wildfire, a storm of fire swept through our city, like football fields per minute, just destroyed something, well, I think the number's closer to 4,000 homes burnt to the ground, and maybe another two, 3,000 other structures just completely burned. It, and, and right in the center of downtown Santa Rosa, there are some 3,000 firefighters from all over the world, and they're there helping to contain the fires. And the air quality in Santa Rosa right now is so bad that we have to wear masks, the, the good heavy-duty ones, just to drive around and get things done. And so, as you can imagine, the heart of Northern California is being broken wide open right now. And uh, what has become apparent to us is that in times of crisis, ordinary human beings are capable of extraordinary acts of courage and kindness and strength and connection, and it's giving us hope for humanity. It really is. Almost everyone that I've spoken to personally who, are, who have lost e absolutely everything has told us that if it weren't for the kindness of perfect strangers and friends and family and neighbors, that this would be unbearable. Yeah. And so I've been talking to people, and one lady I called up, and she lost everything too. She had to get out super quick. Um, they didn't even have time to get the good car out of the garage. They had to take the poor car that they were going to give to their teenage son, and they headed out, they got out, and she got out with absolutely nothing. And she said to me on the phone, but you know, there's one thing that I can't survive without. 
I said, what is it? And she said, it's the Science of Mind magazine, and I can't find it anywhere. And she said, it's my lifeline. I need to read those affirmations every single day. And I was so relieved. I said, I can help. I can do, because, you know, we all want to do something, anything to help each other. So we sent her a care package with Science of Mind magazines in it, you know. We all just want to help and connect right now. That's what's going on. And this is just on the tail of that tragic shooting in Las Vegas and the devastating natural disaster in Puerto Rico and Houston and Florida and on and on and on it goes. It's easy for a person to get what I would call crisis fatigue, you know, which comes when large-scale events come in rapid succession and they challenge us and the main ingredient is uncertainty and instability and it can have the effect of numbing us out to what we would ordinarily know about ourselves and the world. After the shooting in Las Vegas, one of our colleagues, Reverend Frankie Timmers, uh, wrote this poetic prayer based on affirmative prayer. It says, when tragedy strikes, and it strikes every day, when hearts break, and hearts break every minute, when conditions concern us, and they do, when worry and fear seem to take over, which is part of being human, then I breathe, and I let the emotion move through me. And then I turn to that higher power, my higher self, spirit within me. I turn to the ever-present life force in me and around me. And I remember who I am. This is what I bring into life. And this is what transforms me. Oh, I know I may not be able to change others. I may not be able to change the world or the realm of conditions, but I can change the attention of my heart and mind. So today, I choose love and wisdom and truth and grace. Today, I choose to be in the faith that there is good and beauty in the world still, and I bring it forth, whether it it is by means of my compassion or by my activities. I bring what is mine to bring. I do what is mine to do. So daily I take time for prayer so that I am tuned in to the highest and the best in me. So I feel deeply connected to God so that I can be in service to humanity, trusting life, trusting love, trusting myself. And so I release anything and everything that might be in the way for me to live free and live my soul's purpose. Now, don't you know, I've been reading that a lot <laughs> in Santa Rosa, right? Now. I've been reading that a lot because I love that in the prayer she acknowledges the tragedy in Las Vegas and also that she is depending on her trust that goodness still exists and that she is letting that trust activate her to do what is hers to do. So I've got my homework. This is what I'm working on in Santa Rosa. When things get tough, don't go numb. Stay engaged and do what is mine to do and trust that what I do locally affects life globally, and then the most important one, and look for the good that is already happening and partner with it quickly. Don't go numb. And some people are struggling with that right now. They've got crisis fatigue because they're being bombarded by the news that is telling us the worst that is happening all the time. And another colleague wrote, don't let breaking news break you. <laughs> Reverend Temple Hayes, you know, she said, you got to grieve the events, yeah, but don't lose heart. She said, feel the frustration, but then transcend that into proactive actions and solutions because if you try to solve what is going on at the level of what is going on, it won't solve anything. And she says, so be brave. 
and strong and bound with principle. Now, what principle is she talking about that we should be bound with? Well, I have a guess. It's probably the one that is at the heart of metaphysics. You probably know it. It goes like this, that there is one single, continuous, eternal, creative consciousness that we call God within us, and it connects us to each other and to all life, and its creative nature duplicates itself in us as our ability to make new choices all the time, no matter what has gone before or what is happening now. Oh, and to know that and to remember that is to know that there is a light in our soul that is greater than dark. Its name is love, and it can never, ever, ever be extinguished. And fire cannot burn it, and wind cannot move it, and water cannot wet it. Oh, don't go numb. Meister Eckhart, the medieval Christian mystic, he wrote about that. He said there is a light in the soul, a light that is uncreated and cannot be created. And I call that light ordinary goodness. And I believe that the ultimate goal of life, if there is such a thing, is to bring that alive, to let it come forth in us. And Meister Eckhart, he urged us not to flee from the world, don't go numb, but to find our spiritual goodness and embrace it in the ordinary things that we are doing in life all the time. He, he thought of our spirituality not as something that we attain or that we reach or that we add on to us, but something that is already and always present in us permanently, waiting for us to turn to it so that it may come alive in us. Ordinary goodness, then, is not necessarily superhuman goodness although we've seen a whole lot of that in Santa Rosa recently, and that's good. No, it comes to life in ordinary acts, like when we take our neighbor's garbage out for them, or when we love our children and it's hard to do because they're acting out, or, 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 or when we um, make a donation to a cause when our personal finances are already stretched, or when we show up at a, an acquaintance's mother's funeral awkwardly to show solidarity. It's kindness, plain and simple, but not always easy. Sometimes it's awkward, sometimes it's gritty and real and uncomfortable, like this story of a colleague of mine who worked as a chaplain and in a local police department where he got to work closely with the coroner. He would be called out to assist in making difficult death notifications to families. On one such night, he received the call to attend to a death from sudden infant death syndrome, an especially tragic situation in which a child dies for no apparent reason. In the awkwardness of dealing with the long list of official questions, the young mother, supported by her husband, held their child as if holding on for a miracle to happen, for their baby to come back as suddenly as he had gone. Neither the coroner nor any of the officers at the scene wanted to interrupt the parent's vigil to remove the baby. Nevertheless, something had to happen, and the coroner looked to the chaplain for support. The chaplain took a deep breath and said as kindly as he could, trying to erase some of the finality of the words, it's time, and gestured to the waiting coroner. The young couple looked up with resentment at the thought of giving up their boy to the stranger. And then everything changed when the coroner gently took up the baby body and did something unusual. He held the lifeless boy and rocked him tenderly in his arms, saying, I want you to know that I will treat him as if he were my own son. Sometimes, when things get rough in life, I forget the incredible power of ordinary goodness and its ability to make a beneficial impact on the world. 
Sometimes grief and sadness drain our energy, leaving us with nothing left to invest in the present moment. But we can be kind even when we are tremendously sad. There remains in us always the power of ordinary goodness that we can draw upon to do something simple that shows our caring and that will communicate compassion and understanding, even when all is lost. The ordinary goodness demonstrated by the coroner inspires me. Its power is nothing fancier than plain decency. No special training is required to use ordinary decency. No special techniques. It can be messy, uncomfortable, and difficult, but we can trust it. Oh, no special training necessary. Well, we haven't had any special training to deal with what we're dealing with in Santa Rosa. We are having to turn to the one and only dependable skill that we have. Love. Let me tell you about Pete Lasky. He is one of the cyclists on our Center for Spiritual Living Santa Rosa cycle team. He does the AIDS life cycle that raises funds for people living with HIV and AIDS. And he's already raised so much money for people. Well, he had to leave his home in 10 minutes, I believe, or less. And he lost everything. Absolutely everything. I mean, what do you take with you in 10 minutes? Well, he took his child, which is a good choice. <laughs> He's got nothing but his child. And he writes on Facebook, I was just talking with a worker at the local store who did not lose his home in the fire. I was ridiculously happy for him. We even high-fived. I have heard that some people who didn't suffer a loss don't know how to talk to us, those of us who did. Let me say, from my point of view, we are all in this together. We are all affected in some way, and any good news is welcome. I'm very grateful for those houses that were spared. I'm grateful for the people who are safe. If your house still stands, it stands as a sign of hope that ordinary life still exists. And so let's celebrate that gift together. <sighs> oh, I, I, I need to hear more stories like the coroner's story and Pete's story. I need to hear stories like that about ordinary kindness and lifting up the world through it. But too often the news is focusing on what is wrong with us. Oh, you know, like a monster hiding under the bed, lurking. 24-7 <laughs> bad news is there. Been after us for a long time, do you know? And I've got to remember to not let it get into my head. I've got to, to remember, don't let that weaken my spirit. Don't let that try to convince me that that is all that there is to us. No. And you see, the problem is we may have been feeding the monster of bad news for a long time. Once it caught our attention, and then we got attached to it, and then we needed it, and then it became like a drug, and once you're addicted, then it is a valuable commodity. You can tell because if you look on the news stream, look for sponsored content. You know what that means? That means somebody paid a lot of money to be on that page because they know they got you. I have to remember that that bad news is its as if it's trying to confirm, conf confirm the worst in humanity. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. We've had some devastatingly bad news in our nation. I don't want to turn a blind eye to that. I don't want to go numb. I want to know about it. And I want to be careful that I don't go numb through overexposure. I, I want to remain sensitive to what is also simultaneously true about this life. You know, some people have been writing to me, especially about the Las Vegas shooting, and some of them, you know, what, what shocked them the most was their own response. Because they recognize they have become numb. They do have crisis fatigue. And they recognize it because to them, now, shooting is normal. 
is normal. You know, they have crisis fatigue. And they are shocked by that. And they want to return to a more innocent time where once a single violent death was alarming. Now, another one of my heroes of kindness is Dr. David Alt. <laughs> who I frequently misquote. <laughs> I stalk him on Facebook, and you know, because he's so brilliant when he writes about current events, and then I forget what he said exactly, but I remember the message. Like, for example, recently he talked about um, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, it was his birthday on October 2, I think, and he talked about how few people realize that Mahatma Gandhi's activism started from hundreds of innocent, unarmed Indians being slaughtered in their protest by machine guns in the British Army. And he, he asked, what will be the necessary tipping point in our modern culture to bring that Gandhi-like energy forward? And then the part that was most important for him, he said, that, but don't wait for another individual to come forward with the Gandhi energy, because that Gandhi energy is in you and me. And that's the part that I, I'm focusing on because it's the restatement of that principle again for our time. What is it? There is one single, continuous, eternal creative consciousness, a powerful good in the universe that inspired Gandhi, and it is in you, and it is in me, and I don't have to wait for it in other people, and yet, when I do see it showing up, Oh, go to that quickly and partner with that and encourage it and welcome its expression in the world. One of the travelers who went to Bali with us he, on that spiritual pilgrimage, he lives in um, Nevada, Reno. And he is originally from Puerto Rico, where his family still lives. And he couldn't sit around when everything was going down. So he packed up, took off work, and flew to the hurricane-devastated area to help. And this is what he wrote on Facebook. Sunday, the 1st of October, my mom, aunt, and I go to Walmart. The line is very long, and it is already oppressively hot. 25 people come out, 25 go in. It moves. With no power, we can only buy what can be used on one single day. The stock is getting better, but fresh vegetables and fruit are very limited. At the checkout, a lady with two children with her in front of me is obviously concerned she may not have enough money to pay. I tell her not to worry. I pay her checkout overage. She cries. The checker cries. I cry. You see, when I see that, when I see that proactive, love-centered response in the world, I want to go to it and partner with it and encourage it immediately. So I contacted him and said, how can I help? And I ended up being able to send money so that his family could receive water and distribute it among the neighbors. And then in that dialogue, he got to tell me about the Ricky Martin Foundation for Puerto Rico and what good work has been doing out in the northern part of the island. You know, there's so many places to help. And then the next day on Facebook, he wrote, surprise, no lines at Home Depot but also no chainsaws, no generators, or other desperately needed <laughs> items. <laughs> he, said, he writes, I never cease to be amazed that even though people are exhausted, they only cooperate and speak to the good. Never let anyone on the mainland say that Puerto Ricans are simply waiting for a handout. He says, I see the hard work in abjectly terrible conditions without complaint. Even the police, standing 12 hours a day, directing traffic. This is our home and we will do what it takes. Although a few chainsaws would really help. <laughs> I read that and it reminds me there is a power for good in the universe. And I can use it to cooperate when times are tough. And I can use it to speak to the good when things are rough. Since then he says... Things have improved, but there's a lot of work to do. And he reminded me that it is typically after the crisis, when the public attention has moved on, 
that that is when the real opportunity exists for us to not go to sleep. Don't forget those who suffer. Bad news is for real. And we grieve with those people who lost loved ones in Las Vegas. And we grieve with those who lost everything in the fire in Northern California. And what is also for real is that at the same time that there are tragedies, there is also simultaneously strength of character. Goodness that deserves to be honored, seen, called forth, studied, welcomed, believed in. During the Las Vegas shooting, Mike McGarry lay on top of his children to protect them. Carly Krieger put her four-year-old on the ground and got on top of her to shield her. Mike Kronk stayed out in the open with his friend Rob, who was shot and couldn't move, even though it put him in danger, later saying, there was no way I was going to leave him. Taylor Winston, a 29 Marine veteran from San Diego, he jumped a fence to safety, found a truck, basically stole it, and then drove back and forth looking for the most seriously injured to load into the truck and take them to the hospital. And then that father who was shot in the neck, he ushered 30 people to safety. And not only did he do it while he had a bullet in his neck, he also had a cracked rib, a fractured collarbone, a bruised lung, and he said later, at least I got a few people out of there. There is a power for good in the universe. And perfect strangers can use it to help each other. And if you look for it, you will find it even in the news, even on the internet, among your neighbors, among your friends, in your family. I looked for it. I look for it all the time, and I find it like this amazing story about Stan Hayes. He's a professional barbecuer <laughs> who uses his skills to feed people. S since 2011, he's got this nonprofit. It's called Operation Barbecue Relief. <laughs> And he has prepared almost 1.7 million meals for survivors and first responders. It all started in Joplin, Missouri, when the tornado hit there. And he thought he would show up with a, for a couple of days at most with a few people to help in it. He ended up working for 11 days, with gathering 400 volunteers, serving more than 120,000 meals. And since then, his group has grown, and he's got something like 6,000 people associated with his effort. And... That organization has responded to more than 40 disasters in the United States. And he says he believes that the food that they prepare nourishes survivors and first responders in more ways than just through their bellies. There is a power for good in the universe. And we can use it to feed each other and to do things beyond what we ever thought we were capable of doing. So back, back to my practice with what I'm doing in Santa Rosa. I'm trying to stay engaged. Don't go numb. I, I'm trying to do what is mine to do and to, to trust that what I do locally affects us globally. And to keep in mind that there are already beautiful expressions of goodness erupting to look for them and to go to them quickly and partner with them and bring them forth. So this then is the message. There is a power for good in the universe and it can use you. There is a power for good in the universe and it, you can use it. There's a power for good in the universe and it's, it's for real. There's a power for good in the universe, and it's, it's love. And there's a power for good in the universe, and it's also you. So I invite you now to take a deep breath in with me like this. And to sigh, exhaling, letting your eyes close if that feels comfortable. As we close our time together with some words of affirmative prayer from Ernest Hall. 
Today my love goes out to all people and to all beings and to all things. And there is no fear in this love, for perfect love casts out all fear. Amen. And there is no doubt in this love, for faith penetrates all doubt, revealing the unity that is at the center of everything. This love flowing through me harmonizes everything in my experience. And I realize that the love flowing through me emanates from the heart of the living God. Love alone rules my inner experience. And so it is. Hi, I'm David Alt, and I simply want to say thanks. Thanks for taking the time to watch our broadcast here at Spiritual Living Center of Atlanta. We have a vision, and that vision is to reawaken all to their spiritual magnificence. And one of the ways that we are able to do that is through this very medium of broadcasting. So if you got anything out of this, if you felt in any way inspired or if something spoke to you directly, then I extend an invitation to you to become a part of our family by donating. And there are many ways in order for you to be able to do that. One is to simply go to our website at slca.com. And there you will find all different kinds of prompts that will help you support what it is that we are doing here in Atlanta. One way is to become a pledger. That means that you decide on a monthly basis that you are going to help us with this vision. Another way is to donate through our management system called Fellowship One. Another through PayPal. And another even easier way is on your cell phone, you can do what's called text to tithe. And that number is 404-796-7030. Again, thank you so much for your support. And I invite you to come back weekly to see what it is that we're up to. Blessings.